This morning we want to look at the last three chapters in uh, this book by Tom Rainer, I Am a Church Member. Um, So if you've missed any of the beginning things, uh, just by way of recap and catching up, the first chapter was entitled, um, I Will Be a Church Member, uh, or the thing about a church member, and it said, I Will Be a Functioning Church Member. That was chapter number one. And we talked about how every person has a function in the body of Christ. Every part of your body has a function that contributes to the success of the whole and it's the same in the church body as well so I will be a functioning member of the church chapter 2 said I will be a unifying church member I will be someone who brings people together not tears people apart and we talked about the ways that we can be uh, intentional about that chapter 3 was I will let not let my church be about my preferences and desires we talked about unity and the good of the whole and church is not about you come in here to be served, but rather a place where you come to serve. And then the last three chapters that we want to look at today, and we'll be finished with this book, chapter four is, I will pray for my church leaders. And we'll begin by looking at that. Let me just say that I can only imagine how many different things that the leaders of this church have going on. Uh, My leadership in this church has to deal with um, an outreach coordinator and a Sunday school teacher and I find myself extremely overwhelmed just trying to do those two things well. But I can't imagine being a pastor of a church who who oversees uh, every office and uh, wants to make sure he has jam up good sermons to prepare on Sunday morning, Sunday night. He teaches the adults on Wednesday nights and the young people on Wednesday night. He is overseeing our deacons, our building committee, the finances of the church. He's also attending to the spiritual needs of people in the church as people call him and have different things to say or to ask about. He's visiting the sick. He's coddling those members that are hurt and uh, torn up about the different things that are going on. He's reaching out to the lost And he has a family. He probably likes baseball. He likes to watch football. I mean, can you just get with me for a second and know that, man, a pastor has a lot going on, that ministry leaders have a lot going on, and they are making a sacrifice to serve. And Tom Rainer says one of the most important things that you can do, and we must not overlook this, is we need to be committed to praying for our church leaders. And when we think about our church leaders, we need to think about our pastor. I think of him first and foremost. Not only our pastor, but his wife who also deals with all the stress that comes along with it. We need to think about our deacons who as they have their roles to serve here in the church. We need to think about our children's church leaders, our youth leaders. We need to think about our musicians, our Sunday school teachers, our Awanas workers, anybody who has a position of leadership. We need to make a conscientious effort to pray for them. Now, Now, I want you to turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy. And as we look at the scripture this morning, I want to focus on just what the Bible says about the role of a pastor. Now, I'll tell you, I do think you ought to be praying for all of your leaders, everybody that I just mentioned. But first and foremost, as we we look at this, this text this morning, I want us to think about what the Bible calls a pastor to be. It says in the book of 1 Timothy chapter number 3, uh, just starting in verse number 1, it says, this is a true saying, that if a man desires the office of a bishop, and a bishop is an overseer or a leader or what we would call a pastor, it said he desires a good work. Verse number 2 says, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach or ready and prepared to teach, not given to wine, not a striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient. He says, not a brawler, not covetous, one that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, then how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into the reproach and the snare of the devil. And then after those seven verses, it goes in and it says, and then here's what we should expect of our deacons. And look real quick just what it says about the deacons. Your deacons must be grave, not 
double-tongued, not given to much wine, and not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. He said, let them first be proved. He said, then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. And then you know what? We stretch out from there. He begins to describe the role of a deacon's wife. He said that the wife must be grave and not slanders, sober and faithful in all things. Let the deacons, he says, be the husbands of one wife and let them rule their children and their own houses well. For they that have used the office of a deacon, they well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith. And then he says in verse 14, these things I write unto you and I hope to come see you very shortly. Now I'm going to be honest with you. As I went back and I started looking at those few verses there, I mean I just looked at the first one, verse number 2 there where he says a bishop or a pastor must be blameless, the husband of a one wife, vigilant, sober, and of good behavior. Do you know how hard it is just to have good behavior? <laughs> I mean, I was the kid at school always getting my clothespin moved, you know? I mean, it's pretty hard to just maintain good behavior. That in itself is hard enough. But then as you go on down and, and you read, he's got to be given to hospitality. It's not just any man who is qualified to be a pastor. He's got to have a heart that wants to give. And I mean give of your time and give of your energy and give of your emotions to people. A man who's given to hospitality and he's got to be ready to teach. Let me tell you as a teacher, it's hard to always be ready to teach. That means you don't slip up and get out of your Bible for weeks at a time because they might just call on you to fill in and teach a Sunday school class every now and then. Well, what does your pastor look like when he says, I'm sorry, I hadn't read my Bible in about three weeks. Can we ask somebody else to do that? Just the effort that it takes to make sure that you're always apt and ready to teach. I mean, just look at these. I mean, look at verse number 3. He actually literally says he's got to be patient. How many of you feel like you have mastered the art of being patient? The gift and the virtue of being patient. Boy, that's a hard one. And I understand why he says the pastor's got to be patient. You know who he's got to be patient with? His church members. <laughs> he's got to be patient with the people who think they're doing good and they're just dragging him down. I mean, you think you're doing great just by calling him and telling him every little detail of your life. But really, you're probably wearing on his patience. And he goes on to say he can't be, uh, he can't be a brawler. He can't just always want to fight back at people about these things. And he, he says all these different things here. But what I'm trying to get you to see is this. There are a lot of demands on a pastor. And we need to make sure that the least we can do for him is to lift him up in prayer daily. And do you know what I had to do when I first began studying this chapter to put it together for you guys? The first thing I had to do was to ask for forgiveness. I'm not as faithful as I should be in praying for my pastor. And I'm not going to ask you to make me feel better by nodding your head, but I'm just admitting to you that I'm not always as faithful as I should be in committing to pray for my pastor and the leaders of the church. Now I want you to look at a verse right here that's very interesting in verse number 7. It says, moreover, above all those things, he said, he must have a good report of them which are without. That means the people who don't go to the church. You know, I believe that everybody that's in our fellowship here, we all think highly of Blake, don't we? I mean, he's our pastor. If I didn't have a certain degree of confidence in him, I wouldn't subject myself and sit under his ministry. But you know, he says that above all these things, he has to have a good report of the people who are without the church, who are on the outside of the church. You know, it takes a lot to have a reputation that is unmarred. I mean, I know people are going to say something, but to some degree, you have to have a good reputation of the people who aren't in your church. And then he goes on to say, and that includes lost people. I want you to look at this though. This is what I wanted to pull our attention to. It says in verse number 7, lest he fall into reproach, and listen to this, and the snare of the devil. You see, here's what snares are. Snares are traps. And they are intentionally set. Coyote traps, fox traps, bear traps, whatever kind of traps. I'm thinking of those spring-loaded metal traps that have the teeth on them. You know, those are intentionally set by somebody because they say, there's somebody walking around in these parts and I want their foot getting caught in this trap right here. And they set a snare. There are snares for catching birds and there are snares for catching possums and neighborhood cats as well. I've caught a lot of neighborhood cats and traps that we set out for possums and coons. But you know, a snare, and this 
really, I'm going to be honest with you, as I read this, it just started infuriating me. And it really angered me because look at what the Bible says. It says he, he's got to have these different qualities lest he would fall unto the snare of the devil. Hey, let me tell you something. The devil has intentionally set snares and traps for our pastor and for the leaders of this church. I don't know about you, but that made me mad. I thought that makes me sick that the devil intentionally pinpoints and targets people who are in leadership. It makes me sick that he would love nothing better than to see a man who said, hey, I'm going to serve you, Lord. I'm going to serve you in the office of a pastor. Or I'm going to serve you in the office of a deacon. And the devil would literally say, okay, that's the path you want to walk. Then let me come out here and put this trap and this trap and this trap and this trap. I'll tell you this morning, and it literally brings a tear to my eye. In front of every leader that is standing in this church in whatever position, they're walking a path every single day that is filled with snares. Man, I don't even like to see a helpless animal walk and think, man, there's a pit in front of you. There's a trap. Somebody intentionally, maliciously set that in front of you. But our pastor walks a life every day. So do our deacons. So do your Sunday school leaders. So do your Awanas workers, your children's church people, your youth leaders. They're walking a path and someone, the devil, has intentionally set traps in front of them. I don't know about you, but that makes me want to, with everything within me, pray. God help him. Help him. Help every one of them. That as they walk, they don't fall into those snares. Whatever they'll be. A snare for Blake might be a different snare than it would be for somebody else. But the devil who has studied the life of a person who sets out to do good has intentionally set traps before them. I don't know about you, but that makes me think, man, I better be praying. I better be praying. The least I can do for a man who would give his life and his time and his effort and his energy to serve me and make sure that I am fed in God's Word, the least I can do is pray that God Almighty would guide His steps that He does not fall and step into one of those snares. I thought about what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 7. He said, I found a law that when I would do good, evil is present. Let me ask you something. Is Blake's daily desire for this church that when he gets up every morning that he would do good for this church? Is that the heart's desire for our deacons? Is that the heart's desire for every ministry leader, everyone who oversees an office in this church? Is that the heart's desire of every Sunday school teacher and every worker in this church that they would do good in somebody's life? Then when they would set out every day to do good, evil is present around their life. I know we don't like to think about that. But I want you to listen and think, man, how many times do you hear about a pastor falling? That ought not make you think, oh, I knew it all along. <laughs> he wasn't good from the day they called him. That sorry skirt chasing snake son of a gun. I knew he'd get into that. He was always this way from the start. That's who... That is a small win for the devil when he lets that happen. Is something that he set out to do from the very beginning, from the moment anybody steps into an office. The devil goes about quickly and hastily at work saying, I'll put a trap here. I'll put a snare there. I'll do everything I can that this man or this woman's ministry is lost. And that ought to break our hearts. It ought to break our hearts. We ought not thrive on the scandals. Oh, I just want to know. Oh, I mean, how long has this gone on? Oh my gosh, what are all the details? What was he doing? I think, man, God, that killed me. I hate to know that he just stepped into a snare. There was a thousand set before him and he stepped in one and then he got called and man, that was ministry has been pulled down. That ought to break our hearts. But more than it ought to just break our hearts, it ought to say, by golly, I can spare five minutes of my day. I can spare five minutes of my time to pray that every pastor, every Sunday school teacher, every deacon, every worker, every ministry leader in my church, that they could have the, the guidance of the Holy Spirit that they wouldn't step in those snares that are put before them. I don't know about you, and I'm not talking like I'm something great, but every day of my life I feel like I'm just one slip away from losing everything. I really am. Sometimes I lay in my bed at night and I shudder to think, man, if I'd have done that, that I was tempted to do, had I been caught, if I'd have done that, that I was tempted to do, I'd lose everything I have. I'd literally lose everything I had. I'd lose the confidence that every one of those women have in me in that Sunday school class. I'm just a Sunday school teacher. But I'm asking you, and 
Tom Rainer would say that the least you could do is commit to five minutes a day to pray for your pastor, to pray for the ministry leaders in your church. Five minutes a day. What can I pray for? You can pray for him. You can pray for his family. You can pray for his protection. His physical health, his mental health. Hey, I don't want break, Blake breaking his leg working out there on that building. Well, heck, then what are we going to do? <laughs> I don't want him getting, a, you know, whatever different injuries can come his way. I don't want his tonsils being swollen all the time. I don't want him getting laryngitis and not being able to preach for two weeks. Man, that would be, uh, that, I, I would be losing out if that happened. I mean, I want him scotched up. I want him covered in 100% uh, care. I want him taken care of. I want him to be 100% well. Hey, pray for his wisdom. You don't like what he's preaching? Then ask God to give him something better. Pray for his sermons. You think they're too long? Then ask God to get, make them shorter next week. And God will either tell Blake to make his sermons shorter or God will tell you to get over it and deal with a longer sermon. But we ought to be praying for him on those accounts. I told Blake this morning he was making some copies at the copier and I was ready to make these copies and I said, Blake, I've been having some terrible dreams about you. And he said, why are you dreaming about me? I said, well, Tom Rainer's book has been putting this emphasis on praying for your pastor. So every night before I go to bed and every morning when I wake up, I'm praying for you. Well, let me tell you what I woke up this morning in a panic about. Blake was standing down here in one of these Sunday school rooms saying, oh man, my, my chest is killing me, my left arm's numb, my jaw's hurting, and I'm like, you're having a heart attack. <laughs> and everybody was just standing around and, and everybody was saying, well, are you going to go get some, get be seen about it? And he was saying, I don't know, I don't know. And I just knew it's because I've been reading this, you know what I mean? And that's not a premonition or anything like that. That's not a prophetic dream. It's just I've been emphasizing to pray for his health and pray for his well-being. Now don't tell me he's been having chest pains or anything like that but listen don't you agree that's not pushing it too far that's not asking you for too much to think that any man who would set out to do something good evil will be present that the bible literally says that there are snares that are set out by the devil he literally wants him to step into a trap. And every single day, he and every other ministry leader has to walk a tight, close path. It's not asking too much of us that we pray at least five minutes a day for our pastor and the leaders of our church. Now that's all i got to say about that. So chapter 4, and we'll look at a pledge in just a minute. Hey, I'll commit to praying at least five minutes for the pastor and the leaders of my church. The, the pledge says this, I'll pray for my pastor every day. His work is never ending. His days are filled with constant demands for his time, uh, with the need to prepare sermons, those who are rejoicing in births, with those who are traveling through the valley of the shadow of death, with critics, with the hurts and the hopes of others, with the need to be a husband, eventually probably a father. My pastor cannot serve our church in his own power, and I will pray daily for God's strength for him and his family. I feel like that's not asking a lot. That's chapter 4. Here's the next thing. Chapter 5. As a church member, I will lead my family to be healthy church members. Now can I just say this for a second? I know that the Father and the man is called to be the spiritual leader of your home. But can I just ask you, and I'm not trying to be ugly, can we get over that for about 30 seconds and realize that to sit here and keep saying, well, my husband's supposed to be the leader. Well, my husband's supposed to be doing this. Well, my husband, God's called the man. God told him. Can you realize that that endless talking of that's not going to change anything? So I'll just say this to preface it down. If you do not have a husband who is spiritually leading your family, then I think that God would be okay with you being the one who gets up on Sunday mornings and if your husband's laying back there in the bed that you say hey kids we're getting up this morning and we're going to church so just as kind as I know how to say it can we just quit griping about the fact that God's called men because listen ladies that judgment day when he stands before God and God points his finger at him and says you were the man who was supposed to lead those children that'll be tough enough to endure that's what he's got to look forward to enough said about that you know what I mean so as we think about how we will lead our family to be healthy church members, turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. In the book of Ephesians, 
Paul's writing here, he talks a lot about families and then he turns right around and talks about God's relationship to the church. And you see that there's really a close tie and a connection here. In uh, Ephesians chapter 5, I want us to look at these verses here. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 22, we're familiar with these verses, but I want to see the close tie between the family and the church. In chapter 5, verse number 22, he says, Wives, submit yourself to your husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Now we could go off on a tangent and we could say, oh, if He loved me like Christ loved the church, then I wouldn't have any problems submitting. I get that. I really do. Okay, And I think that that was God's idea from the beginning. That if people would see how much Christ loved the church so much that He gave His very life for it, I think that He wanted men to say, hey, I'll choose a woman that I love so much that I would give my very life for her. I, I get that, but let's just move forward. He says, as Christ loved the church... And He is the Savior of the body. He said, verse 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, let the wives be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and He gave Himself for it. And He goes on down to verse number 32. He said, this is a great mystery. Paul's talking here. He says, I know it's a mystery how I'm talking about husbands and wives and then Christ and the church. But He said in verse number 32, But I speak concerning Christ and the church. He said, it's not a coincidence that I'm making all these analogies about how the family should be oriented and how Christ loves the church in that way because there's a tie. And then he goes on into chapter 6, verse number 1, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, that it may be well with thee. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And speaking of dreams, I fell asleep yesterday morning. I got up and I did some reading and I, I did some more outlining on this lesson and I fell asleep in my reading chair and I woke up with my heart racing and I had had a, a dream back when I was a kid and Jariah was about eight years old and he looked just like he did when he was eight in my dream and it was funny and he was griping back at my mother and he said well I'll tell you what I'm not going to do well I'm not going to listen and I grabbed Jariah up by the throat in my dream I couldn't <laughs> grab him up now if I wanted to but I grabbed Jariah up by the throat in my dream and I said I'll tell you what you're going to do I said you're going to obey your parents in the Lord for this is right <laughs> that's what happens when you study and then you fall asleep I'm just glad it was dry that, I was, that was being disobedient it wasn't me So, but you know what he does here is he said I've done something in the way that I designed the church he said I call the church my bride the church is my bride and Christ said I have a great love for her and I gave my life for the church which is my bride and in that same way, I want husbands to love their wives. And I want you to raise children. He said, fathers, you love your children in that same way. He said, don't provoke them to wrath. He said, but, but raise them up, in verse number 4, in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You know, I'm so sick of people saying they can love the Lord but not go to church. You know what that says? I love you, Jesus, but I don't love your bride. There's a problem with that. And I know that pajama church sounds real comfortable. And you can make your story to me about how you wake your family up on Sunday mornings and you all just lay in the bed and you're all just in your PJs and oh, as the father of that family, you just read from God's Word. But there's a problem with that story. You say, I love Jesus, but I hate your bride. I want to associate myself with your bride, Jesus, which is the church. That's hogwash is what that is. You don't love the Jesus but hate the church. You just don't do it. He made some strong, close connections to how He said a family should love each other is the way that Jesus Christ loved His church who was the bride. Now I want you to notice this when He said bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul is writing here. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says there's such a close tie between the family and the church. He says right here in verse number 13, he said, To the woman that has a husband that believes not, if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Verse 14 says, For the unbelieving husband can be sanctified by the wife. The unbelieving wife can be sanctified by the husband. 
He said in verse 15, But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not into bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. Look at verse number 16. He said, What knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or what knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? But as God has distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. And he said, And so I ordain in all churches... He said, the, the, the love that you have for the church... Now here's where I'm coming around to. What kind of church member does this make me? The love that you have for your church and for the things of God. And you love Christ's bride just like you love Christ. He said, it is enough that woman, if you are married to a man who doesn't believe, your love for the church as Christ's bride is, a, is enough to convert a lost husband. He says on the flip side, Husband, if your love for the church, for the things of God, for the things of Christ, if your love for the church as Christ's bride is so strong and it can be an example that you can win and convert a lost wife because of what they see. Now I'm telling you, it is important that our families see our love for the church. And if you want to get mad at me, you get mad at me. But the whole world will lie to you and I'm the one that's going to be your friend and tell you the truth. If you raise your children with a flippant attitude towards church, then when they get older, don't you expect them to have anything better than a flippant attitude towards church. I tried to make eye contact with every one of you. If you raise your children with a flippant attitude towards church, then when they get older, don't you expect them to have anything other than a flippant attitude towards church. If you wake up on Sunday morning and your kids say, are we going to church today? And you say, well, actually, you know, cousin so-and-so's got the lake lot down on Lake Weiss down there. And you know, I'm thinking we might just go over there. So well, let's just go on over there this morning. Okay. The, mind, the, the child's mind clicks. Okay, so we go to church when it's convenient around here. We go to church when there's not something that mama or daddy would like to do that's better. Oh, we want to go over to so-and-so's house today, so we're going to go over there. No, we're not going to go there today. We're going to skip tonight because we'd rather do this instead. And you're leading your children either toward the house of God or away from the house of God. And I'm going to say again, by your example of how much you love the church as God's bride, they will see that and they will pattern their life by that when they're older. Now, I'm not saying that there's a guarantee that you bring your children to church every Sunday and when they get out on their own, why then they'll come every Sunday. But there is a promise in Proverbs that says when you train up a child in the way that he should go, he should not depart from it. He doesn't forget what you taught. But we don't raise our children with flippant attitudes towards church. Yeah, go if you want to. If you don't feel like it, don't. Hey, it's kind of important today. It's not important on this occasion. These holidays are key to be there, but these times are not. It's just kind of in, kind of out. Then don't expect them to get up and be grounded in that. And I'm telling you that as mothers, and we've had this conversation, we've had this conversation because we're close like that, right? Hey, do my kids need to come? Hey, if it's important to you, hey, let me tell you this. And I know I can feel when I'm getting on a soapbox and I'm, I'm getting a little over the top. I don't remember ever having an opinion when I was a kid. I'm going to be honest, I don't remember ever having an opinion about anything when I was a kid. I didn't dare walk into that kitchen when my mama was cooking something. I'm just saying, I know I'm off on a tangent here, but I didn't walk into that kitchen when my mama was cooking and say, I don't want that. Why don't you cook this for me instead? You crazy? I don't remember having an opinion about that. And I sure as heck didn't have an opinion about whether I was going to church or not. And I sure as heck didn't have an opinion about a lot of things. And you know what you say? Well, Tucker, this is 2018. This is different. And I know, and I get that. But you know the Lord brought to remember it's a passage, and I'm going to turn there, and I'm going to make all of y'all good and mad, and then we're going to move on. I thought of a passage of Scripture in Jeremiah chapter 6, and I want you to turn there. 
the Lord gave Jeremiah some instructions here, and I thought, man, we need to heed to these same instructions. In Jeremiah chapter 6, the people of Jerusalem here, that boy, they found themselves so far away from God. They found themselves in a mess and a conundrum. They found themselves walking so far away from what he would want, and you had prophets and people like Jeremiah who were trying to lead them back, right? And do you know what? Listen to this. I just I was just studying this, and the Lord reminded me, seek ye out the old paths. And I looked in Jeremiah chapter 6 and, and I was reading this and he was talking about my people. He says in verse 14, he said, they've healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. They say peace, peace, where there is no peace. He's describing their condition. He said, they say peace, peace, where there is no peace. He says in verse 15, and, and this is God asking, he said, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No. No. They were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Let me just throw this in as a side note. There are some things that ought to make us blush. I'm 31 years old and there's words that make me blush. There's things that come on TV that make me blush. There's conversations that get up, that, that get brought up, that make me blush. I'm not ever going to think again that's a bad thing. Oh, Jen, that's because you're sheltered. Boy, your face will turn red in a heartbeat. You were just sheltered. No, I think there's a little bit of conviction behind that. And the Holy Spirit of God living inside of me, He sure as heck doesn't want to hear it. And I want you to listen and, and see where I'm going with this. He asked the question about His people who used to be so close to Him. He said, were they ashamed when they committed their abominations? And the answer was no. They were not even at all ashamed and they couldn't even blush over it. Now, you you tell me, do we not have a generation of people that you can call on ungodly behavior? They don't seem the least bit ashamed about it. They don't even blush when the conversation is brought up and they're confronted about it. That's a problem. That is a huge problem. And that's where the people here in the book of Jeremiah found themselves, hey, blushing's a good thing. You ought to be ashamed when somebody catches you in a sin. I hope to God there's never a time that somebody can call a sin to my face and confront me about something that I can sit there bold-faced and not look ashamed about it at all. I hope there's not a time in my life that I can be confronted about a sin and I don't blush over being confronted about that. Do you see what I'm saying? But I couldn't help but read the problem happening in the book of Jeremiah and thinking we're right back there today. Listen to what he said. He said, therefore, they're going to fall among those that fall. And at the time that I visit them, they'll be cast down. Saith the Lord. This is the Lord talking here. He says in verse number 16, Thus saith the Lord. Here's what He advised them to do. He said, you're standing here looking at yourself. You're finding yourself far away from where you used to be. Nobody's ashamed anymore that they've committed these different abominations. Nobody's blushing. He said, oh, they're saying they got peace and there's no peace. Look at what He said to Jeremiah. Thus saith the Lord. Stand ye in the way and see. Ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein. Seek out the old paths. We always think we're getting smarter and brighter as the years go on. Can I just say to you that maybe it was better when there wasn't a cell phone in every single hand. Maybe it was better when you didn't have access to the world at your fingertips. Maybe it was better when you couldn't sit in the privacy of your bedroom and access any ungodly filth that you wanted to with not a filter one on it. Maybe it was better when there wasn't a TV in every bedroom. Maybe it was better when children were meant to be seen and not heard. Because I know that's the answer I usually got. Man, I don't want to eat that tonight. Children are made to be seen and not heard. Boy, I've heard that a lot in my life. Amen. Amen. My dad used to say, you got two ears and one mouth. You better listen twice as much as you talk. Yes, sir. And that was my response. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, sir. No, ma'am. I turned out all right. And so did y'all. And I'm just being honest with you this morning. Hey, 
if I want to look and I want to compare where we are now, and I want to look forward versus I want to look back, I don't know about y'all, and maybe I'm wrong, and maybe I'm going to offend you and all your children as well. And I'm sorry, not sorry. But you know, when I look back, I think we were turning out better people. When I look back, I think we had more productive citizens. When I look back, I think schools were doing a better job of turning out productive citizens. When I look back, I think we had more people raised in the nurture and the loving admonition of the Father. So maybe we need to take Jeremiah's advice that God gave to Jeremiah. He said, you tell the people that they need to stand in the way. You read it out of your own Bible. You look down on your Bible in verse number 16. He said, you stand in the way. You ask for the old past because that's where the good way is. Well, we're in the new way. Well, maybe you need the good way. And he said, and you walk therein. And listen to what it says. And you'll find rest for your souls. Oh, but my kids will be so mad at me. Oh, how wouldn't that be just a travesty? Oh, well, they won't like me. They'll be so... Well, well, well. The Bible says when you ask for the old path where the good way was found and you walk therein, then you'll find rest for your souls. But he read your mind already because he said in verse number 16, but they said, we will not walk therein. Oh, (laughs) interesting. They were just as hard-headed then as we are today then. He said, you won't walk in them. In verse number 17, Also the Lord said, I set watchmen over you and said, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But you know what they said? We will not hearken. I know when, hey, this is a totally different time. You say, Jennifer, you are misconstruing that scripture. Oh, you're twisting it. Heavens, no, I'm not. Hey, Jerusalem found themselves in a place where they had walked far away from God. And God said, If you want advice here, nobody's blushing, nobody's ashamed of anything. Then you look back to the old way and you walk in the old past. He said, Then you'll find and rest for your hearts. He said, oh, but people say, I'm not going to walk in those. Is that not what it says? He says in verse number 17, the Lord said, also I set watchmen over you who warned you of coming danger. I'm telling you that the Lord has set watchmen in your life too. There ought to be people you seek for wise counsel. Now whether you do or not, that's on you. But we got a room full of women here that you can seek wise counsel from. But the Bible says in verse number 17, but they said, we will not hearken. <coughs> That's the Lord's way of quieting me down. He's like, calm down. You're being too harsh. Here we go. <clears throat> but we will not hearken. Verse number 18. He said, Therefore hear ye nations and know what is among them. He says in verse number 19 again, Hear, O earth, I'm going to bring evil upon this people. Now how would you get off on that tangent, Jennifer? Well, I don't know. I just started reading, thinking about how it is our responsibility as laid forth in the book of Ephesians that we raise our children in what the Bible says, the nurture and the admonition of the Father. That the Bible says your love for the church will go so deep that if your spouse is lost, they can be converted by seeing your love and your dedication and your sacrifice to the things of God. And I don't know, I just started thinking... Well, it doesn't seem like we got a generation of people who are being raised in the love and the admonition of the Father. And then I just somehow thought about what God told Jeremiah to seek out the old paths. Hey, walk in those ways. I don't know about you, but it'd do us a lot of good a lot of times to quit thinking we're smarter in 2018 than they were in 1947. Do you hear what I'm saying? There were more productive citizens, more people that knew something about loving the Lord and reverence in His house in 1947 than there are here in 2018. And I'm just suggesting that we seek out the old paths. If I offended you, I'm sorry, not sorry, okay? Chapter number 6. Moving forward, I will treasure my church membership as a gift. There's not a whole lot that I can really say about this, but I'll just say this. You know, it's hogwash to say, you know, the Lord doesn't really call us to be members of churches. When He says He loves the church, He's talking about the universal church. You know, here's what I want you to consider. In the book of Acts, the Spirit... Was, was moving and stories were told about churches in, and I want you to listen, in Jerusalem, <clears throat> Antioch, Pisidia, Iconium, Lystra, Pamphylia, Macedonia, Thyatira, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, Corinth, Caesarea, Ephesus, Troas, Rome, Malta. Oh, Paul was just talking about the universal church. He wasn't talking to a bunch of different local churches. That's not what he was talking to. He was. The New Testament books... 
there are several that were written to specific churches. The book of 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and 1 and 2 Thessalonians. I think Paul was most certainly speaking to individual churches that people found themselves members of where they plugged in and they served in those churches. And four of Paul's books were written to individuals in specific church context. The book of 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. And even when you read in the book of Revelation, what does he say? The letter to the church of whatever. The letter to the church of whatever. And I don't even feel like I need to spend a lot of time here. I don't think that obviously you guys deal with that, but I hear that a lot, you know. Oh, God just wants us to love Him. It's not about joining a local church. There's some people that are so opposed to church membership. You know why? They don't want the accountability that it brings. Because if you remember my body, <coughs> I'm talking about my physical body, I'm going to hold you accountable. I'm going to say, Thighs, you better get that together. Or you, I mean, you were going <laughs> to... I mean, I talk to myself. You know what I mean? Hands, you better get this together. My gosh, you try to thread a needle, you know, about 75 times. And I say, fingers, if you don't, man, you're going to be a part of my body. I'm going to hold you accountable for doing what you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Y'all are mad. That's fine. That's okay. I know y'all be mad. And, you know, I said to my eyes when I was trying to read that uh, family feud, man, my eyes, I can't even see. And, you know, the church body ought to be about that. I ought to be able to say to you, I ought to be able to say, Ashley, Kelly, Brianna, you are a part of this church. You have a function to fulfill in this church. You get yourself up and you get in there. Boy, we're far from that, aren't we? I remember calling somebody, I ain't going to tell you who it was, but the last time I called her encouraging her to come back to this church, I hung up that phone and I said, Lord, I will never call her again because she's just straight up ugly. I mean, you know, you're reaching out to somebody who was a member of this church, encouraging them to come back, and they wouldn't even take it as an encouragement. Hey, it's like we're a body here. I need my left arm. Come back. You know what I mean? Some people who fight so heavily against church membership, you know why? They don't want anybody telling them, you need to be here. You need to get plugged in. You're looking different. You're not acting right. Something's not right. You're not faithful anymore. You've Got your priorities out of order. I hope we're beyond that. I hope that if you see me slipping, you don't pull that super spiritual stuff. Well, I don't want her to be mad at me. You better not care if I get mad. If I start slipping and I'm not here, somebody better be blowing my phone up. Do you hear what I'm saying? I hope that you expect the same thing out of the rest of us. Now look, I didn't mean to be harsh. I really didn't. I'm sorry. I feel bad, okay? I'm really not sorry. <laughs> but you know... I didn't put this thing together. I mean, I don't want you to think something happened and I thought, oh, let me, let me find a way to work in this Scripture. No, it's, it's what Tom Rainer said is important. Hey, as a woman, you lead your church to fall in a relation. You lead your children to have a relationship of love for the church. And let me tell you something. You don't just lead by your words. It's what you do. You think your kids are stupid? Let me tell you that it's happened this week. I'll lighten it up, okay? So y'all can be happy with me, okay? I want everybody to leave in a good mood with me. My birthday was last week, uh, August 28th, and somebody brought me a balloon for my birthday. And uh, my friend who were teaches next to me, Alicia Green, her daughter's birthday was yesterday. So Friday, I looked at that balloon in the corner of my room. It's still just as puffy. It ain't lost a bit of helium. I thought, well, when Sarah Ann gets off the bus and she comes down the hall, I'll just give her this balloon. And she'll think I bought it for her birthday. And I said to Alicia, do you think she'll remember that this was mine? And she said, no. And I said, okay. So when she came down the hall, I had it behind my back. <laughs> and she came down the hall and I said, Sarah Ann. Happy birthday! And I sat the balloon down and because I had a little weight on it. And she said, Is that the one we bought for you? <laughs> I literally about fell up out of my chair, Sam Hunt, even though I was standing. I was like, Oh my gosh, kids are not stupid. <laughs> I mean, they're really not. She literally looked straight at me and said, Is that the one we bought for you? I did not think in a million years she'd have remembered. <laughs> but she did. I'm yeah, telling you this. New York boy she had. Yeah, she yes. Like but she said, uh, Is that the one we bought for you? But listen, your kids aren't stupid. And I'm telling you, you got one chance to raise them right. And I know I'm up here giving advice about children, and I don't even have any. I know. 
the and word. I'm done. Huh? Give the word. I'm just giving it from the word. I'm not speaking from experience. I'm speaking from the book of Jeremiah. So look, I'm about to pass out these pledges again. This has got all six of them together in one neat little package. I want you to remember, I will be a functioning church member. I'll be a source of unity in my church. Church will not be about my preferences and my desires. I'm going to pray for my pastor every day. I'm going to lead my family to be good church members. And I'm going to remember that membership is a gift.